Hello, testing. Aha, it's working. Great. I believe it's time to start. So, hey, yes. <laughs> so. so, I actually believe that's Richard under there, but I'm not sure it is. Could, could be Tridge, could be someone else. Um, so hello, my name is Jeremy Allison, and uh, it's a real privilege to be here at LCA uh, and give a talk. Um, I've been to a few others. Uh, I don't come every year. Um, so it's, it's great to be here. Um, I feel like Bono, you know, sort of, it's great to be here in Wellington. Yeah. <laughs> actually, it's a really beautiful place. Um, so yeah, it is actually great to be here. Uh, firstly, First things first, my colleague, uh, Leslie Hawthorne, is giving a really good talk on mentoring at the moment, so you might want to reconsider being here. Just, just pointing that out, you know. She's probably going to be a lot better than I am. Um, second thing is, um, I work for Google, um, but I'm reminded of those wonderful signs that you see in, in uh, pubs in the UK that say, please do not ask for credit because a punch in the mouth often offends. So, even though I would very welcome questions, etc., this is not a Google talk. Uh, I'm not going to talk about Google. And if anyone asks about Google, I'm going to smack them in the mouth. No, I'm going to politely say, oh, maybe you should ask a Google PR person, etc. Uh, who would probably have a meltdown and a screaming fit if they saw the contents of this presentation? But, uh, but what can you do? You know, um, I, I've got my Samba T-shirt on. I'm deliberately not wearing any Google badge stuff. So I'm, I'm off the leash at the moment, uh, as you can tell, which is why it's perfectly delu delu delusional. Uh, everything I say in here may or may not be construed as fiction. Um, there are people in this room who know a lot more about this subject than I do, and I will appreciate keeping the, uh, them keeping their goddamn mouths shut um, rather than correcting me in the, in the talk. Um, they'll tell you the real details afterwards in, uh, in the pub, I'm sure. Anyway, so... What I like to talk about is the elephant in the room that we, don't, we kind of often like to jeer at but don't often address directly. And that is free software and Microsoft and how we interact. So first question is, why do we care about this elephant in the room? It's an 800-pound gorilla elephant, whatever, it's big. But we now have a perfectly servitable system. I mean, I'm running this on a Linux system using free software, free and open source software. Oh, that's one more thing. As this was originally given as a talk at the Free Software Foundation, I refer to Linux routers GNU Linux. And if you are offended, tough. It's just the way it is in this talk. Um, so GNU Linux is a perfectly serviceable system, and we don't actually need any Microsoft code. So, you know, why do we care? Are we just whiners? Um, being English, of course, I'm very good at that. Um, you know, I mean, obviously we should help and, and pity them because, like you, pity people wading in a sewer. Or as uh, James Bottomley um, said in a, a wonderful joke that I'm going to shamelessly steal, he said, he said uh, working with Windows is like being in jail. It's kind of grim. The fur you know, there's this metal furniture. There's no plastic um, toilet seat covers. Everything. There's bars on the windows. It really sucks. You know, you know you're in jail. Um, compare that to an Apple Macintosh where, um, you know, you've got wonderful couches, you've got plasma screen TVs and everything, but there's still bars on the windows and it's still a jail. <laughs> it's just a lot nicer looking jail. Um, <laughs> so we have a system that is absolutely free and we can do anything with, so why are we so obsessed with picking on Microsoft? Shouldn't we leave the poor elephant alone and stop poking it with sticks? Well, the problem is they don't want to leave us alone. Um, their business model essentially depends on maintaining uh, a desktop monopoly um, and then extending that into other areas. Uh, so they kind of tolerate Apple because they're a very convenient, if you play the game Monopoly, get out of jail free card when the antitrust authorities uh, keep calling. It's like, well, we can't be in a monopoly. Look at those guys. Uh, and they're even kind of encouraged. Um, but really, uh, with threats that I'm sure you've read in the papers about withdrawing Microsoft Office from Mac OS, 
they're really not allowed to become a significant threat. They're, they're an irritation, I'm sure, because their adverts are much, much better than Microsoft. But um, No, the, the real threat, I feel, is actually the GPL and copyleft GPL licensed free software. And even though they have shipped on occasion GPL software, really the whole concept behind free software is, is anathema to them. It's like garlic to a vampire. They, um, and yes, they present a friendlier face these days, but if you actually look at the internal documents, some of them are quite old, I agree, but it, I really don't think that internally, especially at the highest level of the company, has changed that much. Um, you get lovely little, um, lovely little emails with his reference there that refer to GNU Linux installations as infestations, um, which kind of fits me because I always thought we were the cockroaches in the walls when we started. Um, but it's really not a sign of sort of a company that's peacefully coexisting, adopting free software, trying to make money out of it. I mean, for, for example, IBM uh, or, or even Google, I guess. Um, but don't they love us now? I mean, Sam Ramji, okay, he's left, but Sam Ramji used to turn up and go, yay, free software, we love you guys. Um, and he's a nice guy, and I believe him. Um, so uh, as I often joke, if you have a, a small church faith somewhere uh, and you want to get sponsorship from Microsoft, call it the open source church faith, and they will turn up with a checkbook and offer to sponsor so that they can go there and put their point of view and so people don't get confused. Um, and as I said, Various Microsoft employees um, are very, very positive about free software publicly, et cetera. And I, and I believe them. I, uh, I actually firmly believe that Sam Ramji, who's someone I know reasonably well, his heart was in the right place. He's trying to turn the elephant around. Um, and and it's, it's genuine. Um, now, Microsoft themselves um, have changed their attitudes towards free software from when they started. And I'll cover that in a little while. Um, but they obviously prefer Apache, MIT, or BSD licensed free software because they can and they do take that code and implement it inside their own products. You know, as occasional security holes that are discovered in free software projects are also mirrored by security holes in Microsoft products uh, often show. Oh, by the way, please feel free to put your hand up and ask questions at any point. It'll be a very boring talk if it's just me stood up here pontificating and making things up. So, um, and I'm happy to repeat questions, even though there'll be people running around desperately with microphones to try and get everyone on the record. So, anyway, so, so like most companies, you know, and I'm not, I'm not sort of blaming Microsoft for this, they, they prefer MIT or BSD or Apache licensed software because they can incorporate that without having to give anything back. Uh, Google's the same. I mean, Google's preferred license is Apache too. So Microsoft, um, e even if you remember the slash dot icon, um, e e is often compared to the Borg. Um, so they have this wonderful little, you know, Patrick Stewart icon with his Borg headgear on, on slash dot whenever they have a Microsoft story. And I actually think that is completely wrong. We are the Borg. <laughs> really are. We integrate anyone's code, we can absorb code, we can take it, modify it, put it out, integrators of everyone's technology. Um, but we're much friendlier. <laughs> we, we don't kind of go in there and take it. We're, think more seven of nine rather than Lacutus of Borg. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an image thing. Um, so if we're the Borg, and I know Microsoft likes to think of themselves as a federation, but I don't really think of that. Think that that's apt. Maybe the Klingons, perhaps. Um, so, so who and what are Microsoft? How how should we view them? So, my my view of Microsoft was coloured by actually working up there in Redmond uh, in the late 1990s. Uh, not actually for them. I was actually trying to sell them something. Uh, so I was up there working on the campus, and I got to know um, quite a few of the groups. I was up there for many weeks, uh, showing them technology, um, showing them Samba as, as, as well. So Microsoft internally, at least to me, is a series of warring tribes. Because, all right, you know, we sometimes get the impression that Microsoft dislikes the free software community, and that's probably true. 
but they hate each other much more. <laughs> so one of the things I learned while I was up there is how much the word group despises the Excel group. I mean, it's not just they don't like each other. They, they you know, would physically try and abuse each other. They would have, you know, sort of cheerleading sessions to humiliate the other guys. They hate each other's guts. Uh, and, and so really is a series of warring tribes, all of which were fighting for power and, and held under the, the great Khan, who, who was Gates, because that picture just kind of fits better, um, but is now Balmer. Um, so it really, is, it really is very much like that. And that makes them incredibly effective, actually, if you think about developing software. Um, they're not try they weren't trying to beat w Word. The Word team wasn't trying to beat Word Perfect. They were trying to beat the Excel team in how much market share they had, which makes them a, a lot more aggressive uh, and a lot more dangerous. And it also means that weird things come out of Microsoft that you don't expect, because what happens is someone suddenly got the wheel of the super tanker and is jerking it one way. Well, you know, and you didn't expect that. Um, so it makes their actions much harder to predict. Um, things come out of the legal team that horrify the open source team and vice versa. You don't ever really know what they're going to do. So let's look back a little while. Um, and they really, they kind of ignored um, free software and were actually quite friendly in a, in a sort of, oh, those guys, they're so cute. They're trying to write code um, kind of a way, um, you know, which, um, you know, they, they were very nice to Trid and I in the early days of Samba in, in that kind of a way. Um, but they, they began to be aware of us as a real competitor um, with the, the leak of what were called the Halloween memos um, in 1998, which Eric Raymond posted, um, annotated up, unfortunately, not in the original form. The only one worth reading is that one there. Please do not read anything else, <laughs> um, any of those others, because they ain't worth it. Um, has worse attempts at humor than I do, which is saying something. Um, but interestingly, in that original Halloween document, uh, which was eventually admitted as genuine by Microsoft, it was a strategy document looking at free software as a competitor and what could be done about it. Um, interestingly, at that time, all free software was listed as a threat, uh, and that includes BSD and MIT license code which aren't really a threat, and they'd already been using, but um, their attitudes towards free software have gotten much more nuanced since then. So it actually contained, um, it was a very interesting document, and it contained the strategy that they have used very successfully from then on. They, they took the ideas in that document, which was very well written, um, even though the author of it now quit Microsoft and apparently works with open source, um, he gave him a really good idea on how to attack us, and it was this. Uh, and I know you can read, but I'm going to read it anyway. Decommoditize protocols and applications. Open source software projects have been able to gain a foothold in many server applications because of the wide utility of highly commoditized, simple protocols. By extending these protocols and developing new protocols, we can deny open source software projects entry into the market. And if you look at what happened um, in the early, late 1990s and early 2000s, that's exactly what they did. And they were very successful at it. So here's some examples of decommoditization. They took the Kerberos protocol uh, that was happily used by the original DCRPC um, server Im implementation, and they extended it. And they added uh, a trade secret protected, and I believe patented, element to it called the Privilege Authentication Certificate, which is essentially a, a dump of uh, groups that you are in. Um, nobody else could implement that. It made, it made an MIT Kerberos server absolutely useless for serving to a Windows domain. Um, I had an, another presentation which I gave a long time ago to a legal body called Microsoft's Web of Interconnected Protocols. And anyone who's done any work in the Samba or uh, Kerberos or Active Directory or DCE world trying to interoperate with Microsoft clients and servers will understand how commingled these protocols are. So a Microsoft client will make a request in one format, and if they get a certain error message, they'll make a request in a different protocol 
uh, which they will then expect to succeed. And, and sometimes even the, the order in which you get the error messages are important for the way those clients behave. And so what that means is you have to coordinate among all these protocols to create a server that the Microsoft client will actually fully and properly talk to. The exchange protocol, um, which someone earlier this week in the government um, sessions was talking about, it, we have to interoperate with exchange better um, because all of the extra features that are available with Outlook and Exchange, they depend on these closed proprietary extended protocols rather than using the open protocols, which do the same thing. And the other thing is, um, although this is less important now, but it was very important in the beginning for establishing IIS as the server for intranets was its complete integration with Windows authentication. So it was extending um, HTTP um, in order to do a Windows-specific authentication message using um, a protocol called NTLMSSP originally, which nobody else could do for a while. So when you've got a desktop monopoly, there's a lot of things you can do with that to leverage that. And for a while, I think this is less important now, but for a while, there was a danger of the, the entire open internet being corrupted into a, a Microsoft to Microsoft um, uh, garden, basically, with, with everyone else on the outside peering through, peering over the wall trying to get in. And so that was having Internet Explorer HTML rendering modes that, you know, uh, everybody wrote to Internet Explorer once they destroyed the Netscape browser, um, meaning that it was Im almost impossible to use a competing browser for a while. ActiveX plugins. Um, they've captured an entire country with that. Any, anyone here from Korea? Or? Um, I, oh, yes, yes, there is someone. Uh, I, so I went to Korea, and I was amazed at how tied the entire infrastructure for authentication and doing online business is to ActiveX plugins. Um, if you don't have it, you can't, you can't play in their online world. Um, Silverlight is a new one, which is basically an attack on Adobe's Flash, which is itself proprietary. Um, so, uh, but, but Silverlight is um, definitely an attempt to unseat Flash in the media space. And also um, removing all the so-called standardized media formats with the uh, WMV, the Windows Media uh, 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 something. Uh, video, thank you, uh, which for a while became the standard video download format. Um, and, you know, there's still many places where, you know, let's face it, if you want to watch porn, you have to have a WMV player. I mean, it's, <laughs> these things are important. Um, you know, as everybody knows, porn drives the advancement of technology. Um, so let's look at how this attack has actually worked in practice. And let's, let's look at one um, scenario that I'm pretty familiar with, which was what the European Union called the workgroup server market. And that's the Windows domain servers and Windows clients. So, uh, as I mentioned, they commingled the protocols and they created this web that it was almost impossible to put another server in um, that could do all of the things that a Windows server could do. Now, you know, hey, I'm wearing the Samba Team t-shirt, there are servers that can do some of the things that a Windows server can do. But in order to get the full features of the Windows client that you paid for, you needed to have a Windows server. So it is essentially leveraging the desktop monopoly to extend into the server space. Um, and you know, we tried to counteract this with code, and that's still ongoing. So what happened? What was the result of that? Well, lawsuits. Uh, not, not by us, even though we ended up being in there. Um, it was actually Sun Microsystems who brought the EU case. Uh, and then, of course, as in the, uh, uh, um, in the way of these things, everybody else jumped on the bandwagon. Um, they were joined by Real Networks, Novell, many, many others. And all it took was about five or six billion dollars to make them go away. Um, you know, a billion here, a billion there, soon you're talking real money. Um, <laughs> so they bought out everybody. They bought Sun cost two billion, Naval was a billion, Real was a billion, uh, some of the smaller players, they were a few hundred million. I mean, but so it was an expensive thing, but they were basically all the major players, all the people who brought these lawsuits, 
were dropping out one by one. The only ones that were left were actually Samba, the Free Software Foundation who was representing us, and as I must put in there, because I was, I was uh, corrected by a very petulant Red Hat executive, he said, we were there too, you know. I was thinking, I don't remember seeing you in the courtroom, but I'm sure they were there. Uh, but Red Hat was there too. No, and they are a, 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 very, a very good free software company, and they did stay there to the end. And one of the reasons, uh, I, I think the reasons why we were the only ones left was because we couldn't be bought off. I mean, because we simply don't own the code that we write. And that's a very, very powerful thing. Um, a, a bit of an aside. Uh, sorry, was there a question there? So the so question was, did they offer to buy us off? Um, I, I would love to tell the, the story of how we turned down you know, a billion dollars to go and have our own private island in the Bahamas, but unfortunately, they believed that we were so incorruptible they didn't even try, which was a real shame. <laughs> were probably wrong. Because, <laughs> <laughs> man, a billion dollars does seem tempting. But anyway, um, uh, did, we, did we feel the need to hire bodyguards? Um, it's funny you should ask that question. Um, my, wife, my wife, actually, in the middle of this, turned to me and said, oh, you're, really, you're really irritating these guys. Aren't, aren't you worried? And I said, dear, they're not an oil company. <laughs> 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 they only write software. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> had it been an oil company, I would have been worried. But now Microsoft is very civilized. Um, so, so the case did survive, although it got very, very shaky. And many years later, uh, they lost. Um, it was a very close run thing. I think there were 12 judges on one side, 13 on the other, on the winning side, which was to find Microsoft. And they lost the case. Uh, so what was the result of that? Um, well, mixed. Excuse me, they still dominate the workgroup server market. I mean, you know, almost everybody here, I'm sure, has to interact with some way or other in an Active Directory domain. I believe they have about 70, 80% of the authentication market. But in doing this, um, and this is always the way, they took their eye off the ball and they missed the appliance market, which is where a lot of the money is. Um, so it's, it's very nice selling big directory servers. But what happened was, what bubbled up was the NetApps and the EMCs and people selling massive amounts of disk and the IBMs and, and a million Samba-based appliances all out there. Um, and so they have to interoperate with us anyway. It's, it's very interesting. One of, we actually were begged by Microsoft to release a new version of Samba a couple of years ago because uh, their customers just kept calling up and complaining that the Windows Vista at the time wouldn't work with their, their little NAS appliances, and Vista was broken. <laughs> I, I felt so... <laughs> I, I actually had a lot of sympathy, <laughs> because I've been there. <laughs> I know exactly how that feels. Um, so they ended up having to document all of their proprietary protocols. Um, they were fined a billion euros, um, and Interestingly enough, um, the documentation of the protocols has had a very big effect, and it's actually had a very big effect on Microsoft. Um, uh, uh, kind of an off-the-record comment, one of the Microsoft engineers said to me, he said, yeah, he said, it's great now we've got proper documentation. It really makes writing this stuff easier. I mean, <laughs> who knew? <laughs> <laughs> but, but for some of the stuff that Samba uh, implements, some of the old, the original SMB stuff, uh, there are Microsoft engineers on the campus who live in fear that we will ask them questions because they know they will have to essentially do code, ar code archaeology uh, and try and figure out how stuff that they simply dare not touch anymore works. Um, but the other thing that happened was there was a massive amount of negative press coverage, which I think really, really did the most damage. So yes, they ended up with all the money, but their reputation took a real bashing, which I think that hurt most of all. But they're very smart. And they learned that having trade secrets and trying to keep things proprietary is not an adequate defense against free software. So yes, you can decommoditize protocols, and it will slow the free software guys down, but it will not keep them out of your turf forever. So they had to start looking for something new, which I'll come on to in a little while. 
So case number two was OOXML, an incredibly dirty fight, <laughs> actually. The dirtiest fight I've ever seen, I was horribly involved with. Um, so for those of you not aware, Microsoft periodically revs their document file formats. The old sort of, oh, I have a new version of Word, and um, my colleagues can't read my documents. So obviously the solution, and because I'm the... Because I'm the CIO, obviously the solution is we must buy new versions of Office for all my employees, <laughs> um, rather than actually forcing it to save in a standardized format. So they decided, and I, I believe this was pressure from um, open standards, they decided to move from a binary blob format into an XML-based format called OOXML. Um, to compete against open Office's open document format, which was an ISO standard. And so they attempted, they thought, well, these ODF guys have a, an ISO standard and they're getting traction in governments. We must have one of those too. So basically they, they I, I'm not going to go into, I, I could make horrible accusations here, which I'm, I'm, I'm sure you would understand. I'm not going to go into too much details. Let's just say they got an organization not unlike a, a sock with eyes on it to submit um, their, their, pro, their um, document format into ISO. And they tried to get this thing standardized in less than a year as a 6,000 page uh, specification. Now, how, how, is there anyone here who's actually worked with ISO and the standards organization? Okay, so not many, but um, so I'm sure you people will understand. It's unusual to standardize a six, <laughs> let's just say it's unusual is a good word, to standardize a 6,000 page specification in less than a year. I'm sorry, your question? Ah, so the comment was it's, it's 15 standard deviations above the mean for fast tracking a standard, um, which, which I can believe. Um, and it was a brutal battle. So um, people accused ISO of being in Microsoft's pocket. Somebody came up with that lovely little logo there. Every single major competitor sort of weighed in on the side of uh, ODF rather than OXML. There was um, massive internal, there was massive international public opposition. People turned up to standards meetings who'd never turned up to, to standards meetings before uh, and were told there were no chair, which was one technique that was used in a, a country that should remain nameless. And the amazing thing was, um, after all this, uh, there was a comment from a, a, a Malaysian blogger I still remember, and he at the end of it all, he said, this was awesome, he said. It was one company against the entire world. You know, unbelievable amount of public pressure, etc. And that company won. Think about the power to do that. Think about the power they have to be able to do that. It's an amazing achievement. An achievement for evil, but it's an achievement no, no less. So... Um, there are so many dirty stories around that that uh, I might tell over a beer sometime. But essentially, it exposed the rampant corruption in ISO. Uh, and one of the worst things that happened out of that was that ISO, which was previously respected by people who didn't know it that well, um, became absolutely despised. Uh, and, and, you know, there are some countries after this thinking of simply pulling out because it's, it's simply not worth uh, participating in a process that is as so obviously corrupt as this. The good side of it is that many governments actually started thinking, hey, hang on a minute, if there's this much money in it, how can we get some? Uh, oh, may maybe we could uh, propose um, asking between ODF and OXML as a standard, and then those big companies will bribe us. Great. Um, so uh, it, it did raise awareness of, of lock-in in public document format. Um, so what was the long-term result for Microsoft? Uh, yes, they won. Um, but again, I, I think the result was poor. They still have a monopoly. Uh, people still buy the latest versions of Office and use them. However, it caused a new EU investigation to start into Office file formats, which is the last thing they wanted. And amazingly, Microsoft blinked in the staring contest they announced that they would implement ODF within Microsoft Office. Now, they've done it badly. And, and, and with all the uh, 
with all the goodwill of a six-year-old being told to tidy up its room. I mean, <laughs> the implementation doesn't interoperate, it, it strictly adheres to the standard, et cetera, et cetera. But they were forced to do it. And the other thing that they were forced to do, because of all the complaints about the OXML format, is they were forced to actually completely and accurately document their old word dot doc and dot .ppt, et cetera, binary file formats. And, you know, there was incredible negative publicity, uh, extreme rancor about ISO, <coughs> excuse me, and, and lots of governments are now looking at ODF as a possible standard format. And, and you know, I mean, I, I've been trotting around various state governments and submitting things, and my, my, um, my comment is always very simple if anyone asks me about sort of, you know, why should we examine ODF? And the whole point is, look, if you choose ODF as your long-term document standards format, you will have IBM, Google, Microsoft, Novell, Sun, whatever, uh, Oracle, all bidding for your business. If you choose OXML, you have one vendor. Uh, yeah, they'll claim that Novell can do it, but really they're a silent partner. You, you have one vendor. So, you know, if you're going to get discounts on your software, how are you going to get that? By having competition. So, case number three I'm going to look at is trying to corrupt the, the open internet. Um, and uh, I've mentioned this a little previously. Um, in fact, most of it, yeah, so uh, creating IE-only websites, Windows media format. Um, the other thing that they really tried very hard for a while was to make ActiveX the, um, the only way to develop internet applications. And the security implications of that sort of torpedoed that, I think, pretty rapidly. Um, but the other thing was the, the, the polluted Java, which there were more lawsuits over, uh, and the attempt to replace it with .NET, which, is, um, which they hold many patents on. And you know, I, I, I have reasonably strong feelings um, about the mono implementation that's on Linux. Um, I know lots of people disagree, but to my mind, it's, it belongs in the restricted area, just like the patented codex. Um, so, you know, .NET, to my mind, is not something that we can use as an, uh, as an open, uh, open standard. So the result is this is still ongoing. Um, Firefox really has made the difference. Firefox was what broke the dam on this. Um, sort of genuine, you know, Users will have no interest in free software, no interest in anything but Windows. They know to click on the little, little red Firefox icon to be safe. Um, another EU investigation got opened. Ajax applications started taking over from ActiveX. Um, and Flash um, trounced Silverlight, basically. I, I still think so. They keep pushing Silverlight, but I think that's a losing battle. Uh, Flash is so entrenched that, um, I mean, that's not great for free software either. Um, but it, at least it's um, something that uh, we are attempting to recreate using the Ganache project and other things. And there are at least Flash players that run on Linux. Um, the, and the, the reason, I, I actually, stepping back a little, probably the reason that this was much harder for them to win, and the credit for this, should go to Apache. Because without, when you control the client and the server, it's easy to tie them together so tightly, like they did on the workgroup server market, that it's very hard for anyone else to get a toehold. But with the web, they never control the server space. And so it was much, much harder for them to turn it into a proprietary walled garden. And so I, I think the long-term result of this is they're going to fail um, on this one. They're going to lose the attempt to proprietize the internet, and it will remain open. Um, and governments are now recommending that people not use certain versions of Internet Explorer. But you know what that's like. People are going to see, don't use IE, whatever, and just think, don't use IE. So that's going to accelerate the market for Firefox and other browsers. Um, I'm still hoping that, that Adobe might eventually open source Flash. Um, you know, uh, question. Oh, so, so the comment was, and I, I didn't realize, that, that uh, Europe, the European governments actually did say, don't use IE at all. Um, and, right, because of the, the exploit that was recently announced. And Microsoft was saying, well, IE 8 isn't so bad, uh, which is probably true. But 
yeah, I, I'm really hoping that, that most people move away from using IE on the web. <laughs> oh, and, and, and so uh, was that... Uh, yeah, so, so the other comments were, well, the others aren't perfect, which is, which is very true. I mean, there's, there's bugs in all software. Um, yeah, question. Oh, okay, cool. Um, so at a recent security conference, uh, IE8 lasted eight minutes. So I suppose IE9 will last nine. Hey, they're getting better. <laughs> <laughs> So the, uh, the other thing that will, that will prevent them from dominating the internet is the move to cloud computing, um, whatever that really means. Um, so, uh, and Microsoft is just one of many players in that, in that market. But having said that, from a free software perspective, cloud computing isn't so great for free software either um, because it turns the GPL uh, into an MIT-style license. Uh, what it means is that cloud computing vendors can take GPL code and because they're only running it as a service on the other side of a network connection, they can make changes to GPL code that because they're not distributing the software, they don't have to give back to the community. So that's, that's a threat that we need to think about. So, they're a bit stuck. Trade secrets don't work anymore. Antitrust authorities are causing trouble. Standards, people are getting interested in open standards. What are they going to do? How, do? how does a poor monopoly regain control? Would you like to play a game? <laughs> <laughs> patents. There's always patents. So, um, this is a really interesting quote. Um, uh, I don't know if people are aware of it. It's worth reading out. If people had understood how patents would be granted when most of today's ideas were invented and had taken out patents, the industry would be at a complete standstill today. I feel certain that some large company will patent some obvious thing related to interface, object orientation, algorithm, application extension, or other crucial technique. Hmm, I wonder who that would be. Um, so interesting, that, that, interestingly, that came from an email where Bill Gates was agreeing with Richard Stallman, who had, at the time, created the League for Programming Freedom. Um, so today, um, it's uh, property is good, if you go back to Glyn Moody's talk this morning. Uh, it's uh, owning things is good, owning more things must be better. Um, so we honor and support the honoring of intellectual property, that hideously weasel phrase. Um, false patterns are going to have to play by the same rules as the rest of the business. What's fair is fair. When everyone, anyone starts to use that kind of phrase, I always start checking my wallet. Um, and of course, then there's, the, uh, there's the, the good, the bad, and then there's the really ugly, which is open source software violates 235 patents, and we're not going to tell you what they are. Great. Thanks, Brad. Um, so patents are still a monstrous threat. So why are Microsoft turning to software patents? Um, well, all the other strategies have failed to prevent the spread of free software. And patents have the wonderful benefit to Microsoft and other companies of that they're completely incompatible with the GPL, but they still are, uh, they're not addressed by uh, BSD or MIT, and, and so you can, people want to produce code and that could still be used by Microsoft. So we've seen this, especially in the appliance market. Microsoft will go to a company off the record, this is never ever done in public, and say, nice product you have there. Shame if somebody brought a patent suit. Um, so, uh, well, you know, you've got two options. You can re-architect, use Windows. Here we have Windows Mobile. It'll do everything you want, etc. Or the other thing is, why don't you give us a cut on all of the free software that you're using? So it's an attempt to create the work that we do into a Microsoft revenue stream. And I don't know about you, but that really pisses me off. <laughs> which is why I'm a big fan of the GPL. Um, so what's the real threat here? Well, the real threat is patent cross-licenses. Um, and Novell was the most egregious example of this, um, which I know about for obvious reasons. 
Uh, and what those patent cross licenses do is they split the community into walled gardens where people who are inside the happy, blessed patent agreement um, feel superior and are not threatened by, by those great unwashed outside who, who have to fend for themselves. So um, this is one of my complaints about Mono. Um, Mono is great, and Microsoft say, oh, it's, it's uh, completely, you know, we, we give grant patents, uh, we grant patent use for this thing, but only if you get it from our partner, Novell. You download it from anywhere else, not covered, mate. You only, ha you ha only have to get it from our preferred vendor. So there are other companies that have done cross-licenses, HP and IBM, to, to my knowledge. Um, but at the time, and these were done earlier, because, uh, I mean, let's face it, companies depend on cross-licenses. They explicitly excluded free software. The, the one I know specifically was the HP one, which essentially said, and all of this stuff, notwithstanding, doesn't cover anything under the GPL, because HP lawyers are really smart. Um, but since then, there have been many other cross-licenses. Um, but they're all under NDA, and you never get to look at them. So what terms have they actually agreed to? Um, that's a very dangerous and scary thought. Yes, question. So there's a very good point. Sorry, yeah, a very good point someone made there is that not only does Microsoft not want, and the companies not want to know, uh, other people to know what terms there are because of the free software people might complain, but they also like to have NDAs because they can cut separate deals with separate companies. And the smaller the company, the harder the deal, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, question. So is there any, so the question was, is there any hope that these dealings would fall foul of uh, anti-racketeering? Anti-racketeering laws. I don't know of any investigation into those things. Oh, good, good point. So the, 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 the comment was, it sounds very much like the organized crime protection racket, which is true. Um, but remember, it's not a crime when a multi-billion dollar corporation does it. <laughs> it's only if you or I did that. <laughs> That's when it's a crime. Um, um, yes, uh, uh, the comment was individuals could bring prosecutions, but I, I, don't, I don't see a, a peasant-wielding mob with pitchforks storming the, uh, the halls of, of Redmond or... or... <laughs> uh, I, I, I forgot my pitchfork truck. Um, we'll have to arrange that later. Um, so... Um, one of the obvious ones recently um, was the TomTom -Tom lawsuit, um, which was the first direct attack against Linux um, for the FAT file system, which is, um, which is used in Linux for compatibility with, with USB devices. And this, this, for me, crossed the line. This was actually one of the reasons I ended up creating this talk, was because before, Microsoft um, always said, and I had to agree with them, that they had software patents for defensive purposes. They had never aggressively gone after the free software community with their patents, and their, their comments were, well, we have patents, everybody has patents, you know, that's to prevent other people suing us, it's not to be aggressive, et cetera, et cetera. But then with the TomTom -Tom lawsuit, everything changed. I, I don't think people realize how much that changed the game, because that was the start of the, I mean, that was the first nuke basically going off. And, and People should really pay attention to that. Um, and the interesting thing was, I firmly believe that Microsoft's open source, source team were, no, I know Microsoft's open source team were absolutely horrified <laughs> when they read about this in the press, <laughs> which was how they found out. Um, because this just completely undid all of their outreach work. Um, because they actually are believers. They're trying to change Microsoft from the inside. Um, so this really does mark a change, is that patents have now been used aggressively. And, and that's a line that once crossed, you can never go back. So you can never trust Microsoft over patents anymore. And this is why I pound so much on the Mono project, because all of their bleatings about being covered by Microsoft patent promises, they don't count for anything anymore after TomTom. -Tom. Yeah, there was a question. Yes, 
uh, so, so, so the comment is Microsoft has had a lot of patent cases against them, and I, I'm going to mention another one. Yes, that, that's absolutely true, but um, most large companies get patent cases against them. Um, but this was a case of using patents against a GNU Linux using, a free software using company. And what that does is it, it basically crosses a line that, that, bef that before has not been crossed. I mean, it, it's a shot across the bows of every single Linux vendor. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure that had they wanted to and they looked around, they could have found patents that TomTom violated that had nothing to do with Linux. <laughs> I mean, those things are so broad and so stupid that you can find anything. You sort of, sort of a, a patent for the walking of a linked list or something. They, they could have found almost anything that they could have sued over. Question. Yeah, um, oh, yeah. I get a microphone. Um, Okay, so the the TomTom -tom lawsuit didn't originate from any, you know, from the Ramjis and the, and the various others within Microsoft. Do you have any insight as to where it did originate? Um, In other words, is this coming from the evil mind of Balmer? Uh, so where did this originate? I, I actually believe it came from Microsoft Legal. Um, again, one of those warring tribes who grabbed control of the super tanker for a little bit, um, and Balmer probably okayed it without much thought of what it would do to the open source group. Because it's, hey, it's nothing to do with those guys. This is us suing TomTom -tom over some, you know, probably the fact that it was, it was open source, uh, and a pattern that covered the Linux kernel. Maybe he knew about it, maybe he didn't. But I know it came from the legal department. And it was, it was, it was, yeah, it was, uh, the comment was it was a retaliation for TomTom for -tom moving from Windows to Linux. I don't, I don't know about that, but I know that it came from um, high up in the legal department. And it was essentially somebody trying to raise the profile of their department within Microsoft. Um, that was simply all it was. Uh, yes, it certainly worked. So what's the result of this? Um, well, you're either with us or against us. Um, they hate us for our freedoms. Um, Never-ending war. This is what it comes to. Never-ending war. Um, even them having to withdraw a version of Office and rewrite it, uh, even with all of the patent trolls that pop up and try and sort of, you know, roll up, roll up, here's Microsoft, roll the dice, see if you can get lucky on a patent. Um, even with, um, with all of this, they are still one of the strongest supporters of software patents worldwide. Because essentially, yeah, okay, they may lose a couple of billion dollars a year. Yeah, big deal. Uh, it'll take something off the bottom line. But the advantage of being able to freeze out the market for all of the competitors Hey, it makes, it makes writing software a game that only big boys can play. No little you know, free software advocates allowed. And so I think what we should, and what we see, is Microsoft in standard as organizations and talking to governments, pushing what are called RAND, reasonable and non-discriminatory patented standards. And, and so the, the, the weasel word in that is reasonable. <laughs> What's a reasonable um, patented standard? What's a reasonable payment? Essentially, it's a method to lock out any collaborative free software from any standards. So look for them to be pushing patents in standards as much as possible. Uh, I'd like to think that will change. but um, So what, what other things should we look at um, for Microsoft's actions? Well, there's what I like to call the netbook effect. Oh, I'm running out of time. Um, so... It's a new market, and with, under netbooks, I'm covering all sorts of things like mobile phones, although, although Linux has a much uh, larger share in the mobile phone market, um, and the alternative clients. And this, I think Microsoft is just waking up to. They have to quash this threat in order to maintain control of the desktop. Um, it, once alternative devices become popular, desktops stop be, being important, or they become less important. And when you don't control the majority of desktops, people write applications that aren't locked to your platform. And it's always been about developers, 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 if you, uh, if you see me in Portland. Um, anyway, uh, so they no longer use um, the per processor licensing agreements, which were marked as illegal. But they have now something called co-marketing dollars, which says that if you, th this is the reason that when you go to a Dell um, uh, website and you're buying one of the Dell Linux machines, 
at the bottom of the website, there's always, on the page, there's always a little thing that says, Dell recommends Windows Home Premium for, <laughs> for all our systems, even, even though you've specifically selected the Linux one. That's the co-marketing dollars at work. If they say that, Microsoft essentially underwrites Dell's marketing expenses. Um, so I, I think the next war um, around devices is going to be netbooks, mobile phones, and, and the appliance market. Um, so, what you know? How should we respond to to our elephant? Uh, well, I mean, ignoring it is a good strategy. Uh, it's probably something we should do. Um, and basically just keep doing what we're doing, because what we're doing is effective. And I, I was greatly heartened by Glenn's talk this morning. Um, keep writing software, keep sharing it, make sure it's under a copyleft license so it can't be appropriated. Um, and this is the most effective strategy we have. Um, keep our eyes on the prize. We keep doing this. You know, we will end up with a world where, yes, there may be walled proprietary gardens, but we can ignore them. We're creating our own content, we're creating our own software, eventually maybe creating some of our own hardware. Um, and let's just build, that, build the world that we want to see. Um, the other thing that we can do is try and build a fence around the elephant. Um, and for that, that's just a lot of public policy work. Um, keep pressure on governments to investigate um, monopolies, to make sure that standards are open, uh, not rand, patent-free, um, and you know, transparency and openness, as Gloom was saying, that, they're the key, because uh, elephants see very well in the dark. Um, so I, I must tell one story. I was, I was advocating to a state government at one point um, in the o ODF versus OXML wars, and um, we did a presentation, and they were, they were very pleased, very interested, and then the Microsoft guys did their presentation, and it was like they couldn't be bothered. They just kind of like, oh, yeah, we don't think that's right. You know, they spent about 15 minutes, and it was pathetic. And I, I came out of there afterwards, and I'm having a drink in the bar, and I'm saying, wow, we did really great there. I think we, I think we you know, we, we really beat them. And, uh, and uh, somebody uh, uh, reasonably famous in the Linux world came up to me, and he said, he said, what did they do? I said, yeah, they spent about 10 minutes meeting, you know, with the senators. And he said, that's because they had their meetings two hours before you turned up. <laughs> in private, because <laughs> this was a public meeting. They were already done. That's why they didn't need to bother. And I think that's very true. And I went, oh, yeah. And indeed, uh, it didn't turn out the way we expected. Um, so how do we respond to patents? Um, we have to try and keep patents out of the rest of the world. I don't know the state of New Zealand and Australia. I know. It, it, Europe's very interesting. I know a little bit about Europe. Essentially, none of the European states allow software patents. It's explicitly not allowable. The European Patent Office, which is centralized, happily grants software patents all the time. So all of the usual suspects have been getting software patents in Europe, none of which they can enforce. They just need one little change in the law, <laughs> and then all of a sudden, all these patents that they have lined up and ready to go are there to completely screw any free software development in Europe. And there is a never-ending battle um, between the people who want to establish, uh, let, let's have a new European-wide patent system. Anytime, anytime you see the words European-wide or whatever, you know it's the forces of evil at work, basically. Um, because they can't, they can't do it through national governments, so they're trying to use transnational organizations. Um, and the other thing is, he's keep pointing out that Microsoft is losing a lot of money. Um, there's a very famous American bank robber, I believe, in the, in the Depression called Willie Sutton. And when he was finally caught and brought up before a judge, the judge said, why do you rob banks, Mr. Sutton? And as though explaining to an idiot, he said, because that's where the money is, Your Honor. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and patent trolls are like that. I mean, they go after corporations with money. I, I remember being in HP and having a, a long conference call with one of our lawyers about software patents, and I was saying how worried I was that Samba might be attacked, et cetera, et cetera. And he said, you idiot! Nobody's going to sue Samba. Why would anyone bother to sue Samba? You haven't got any money. They're going to sue HP. <laughs> <laughs> and it's exactly right. They go after the money. Um, so large corporations really should have an incentive to destroy software patents. I don't actually believe that's going to happen, but... 
<sighs> That's the pattern trolls, yeah. Uh, so theoretically, the comment is pattern trolls could theoretically sue Samba but, and have a chilling effect. But there's no money in that for pattern trolls. Um, so, the, that, so the comment is a corporation could bankroll a patent troll. I, I, I think that's rather more subtlety than most corporations are used to doing, really. Um, could happen, I suppose, but you, you're getting into, well, SCO Group, no, they're just stupid. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> look, look at Dal McBride. Does that man look smart enough to run a conspiracy to you? I don't think so. Um, so, so Tridge is actually going to be doing a wonderful talk uh, tomorrow, I believe, on how to respond to patents. And as usual, it's rather than the delusion of ramblings like mine, it's actually a useful talk on what we can do to respond to patent attacks. And so I would suggest that everybody go to Tridge's talk. Um, and the other thing to do is working for a corporation is a moral choice. So, you know, if you've got a Microsoft, and I've done this to Sam Ramsey, poor guy, probably one of the reasons he left, he kept getting hounded. Um, I, I created a lovely little certificate sort of with Steve Ballmer going ooga booga and uh, the open source community, you know, uh, hereby awards Sam Ramji as uh, an award as a, a, a fat patent troll, <laughs> which, uh, which actually worked at the time. So I, 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 if, if someone from Microsoft is giving a talk about how much they love free software, I ask them hard questions. I'm not rude. Um, I, I don't, you know, I'm not abusive or anything, but I stand up and I say, excuse me, you say you love free software, but what about, you know, people have to answer these questions. Yeah, question. Are you, are you aware that Microsoft uses you as a project as a PR point? Because I think that would be a yeah. so, so the question is, am I aware that Microsoft is using me as a PR person for them saying, um, a well, as a, as a PR a point saying how wonderful they cooperate with the open source community. Yes, I'm aware of that. Does this talk sound like a Microsoft PR talk to you? <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so, look, Microsoft engineers work incredibly well with Samba. They go above and beyond. I'm not knocking Microsoft engineers. They go above and beyond the call of what they're required to do. They are required to help us but they go above and beyond that, and they've actually helped us fix bugs in our code that they didn't need to do. I have no quarrels with Microsoft engineers whatsoever. The Microsoft Corporation and their, over, their, their actual directions, that's what I'm calling out here. Um, the engineers are great people. I encourage, if there are any Microsoft engineers here, or I encourage you to take them out, buy them a beer, and say, why are you working there? <laughs> <laughs> So I'll end up, because I'm running into people's lunch, is hopefully elephants will be able to learn new tricks. And uh, for all the IBM employees in the audience, I'm sure you remember a time when IBM was just as hated and feared as Microsoft. I mean, I, I do. And, you know, I'm a big fan of IBM right now. Uh, they're, they, they know how to work with the free software community. They're, you know, they're open. They're friendly. They have a crap load of patents, of course, but nobody's perfect. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, elephants can learn to change. And my hope is that, you know, and I don't know how long this will take, hopefully uh, less time than it took IBM, but hopefully Microsoft will become like IBM is today, a, a working member of, they're probably never going to be a full member of the free software community, but I, I think they could be a quite productive member of the open source community, if you see what I mean, if you see the difference. So that's it. Uh, any other questions at the end people would like? Yeah. Can, sorry, can I just make a point before we do the questions uh, over here? It is actually lunchtime, so uh, there's another 30 minutes left until lunchtime finishes and the next session start. Uh -oh. Feel free to, to wander around, or we can keep question time going for a little while. Another hour. Today's a long lunch? Okay, no worries. Yes. Okay, we'll use the microphones for the questions. Question there. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Um, Oh. We're certainly happy to stay on and take a few more questions, but just before everyone goes, I'd like to thank on behalf of LCA 2010, Jeremy, for coming in and sharing this talk with us today. Thank you. Oh, thanks very much. Thank you.
Great. So there was a question. I'll, I'll try and talk while everybody's leaving. Um, I've been trying to keep track of this mono thing. I haven't really understood what all the contention has been about until your talk. Um, one thing that occurred to me, let, let's, assume, let's assume for a minute that mono gains some ground and people are successfully using their Windows programs under Linux. But we know that uh, Microsoft has promised that they won't call in any patents on that project, as you've just said. That's, that's not true. Uh, they promised they won't call in any patents so long as you got your mono through Novell. Okay. So if you, if you, if you used it, um, let's say you're using Red Hat or Ubuntu, and it was a part of that, they can quite easily sue okay. other applications using that patented technology. Sure. So at, at work, for example, we're using mono and, uh, under Ubuntu. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I think Ubuntu being a very popular project as it is, um, a lot of people are using it, even unknowingly, um, mono under Ubuntu. My question still remains, and, and that is that um, if they're using this, this software um, and Microsoft does call in one of those patents, where all of a sudden the rug's been pulled out from underneath these people and they're, they're forced directly back into Microsoft because their reliability or their, their usability of that software has depended on Mono then it's, and they can't, they've got to go straight back to Microsoft. Exactly right, that's the point. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's a significant my, that's threat. My, my feeling is that the Mono technology, nice though it is, and don't get me wrong, my entire photo collection is... Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, my entire uh, photo collection is in uh, Xbox. Um, but... And that's why my feeling is that Mono needs to be in the restricted um, archive, restricted depository. Thanks. Yep, it's working. Any more questions or? Oh, okay.